Book One, Chapter Six and Seven of the Fatal Three by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six. Ah, pity! The lily is withered. George Greswold left the dairy garden like a man stricken to death. He felt as if the hand of fate were on him. It was not his fault that this evil had come upon him that these poor people whom he had tried to help suffered by his bounty and were perhaps to die for it he had done all that human foresight could do but the blind folly of his servants had stultified his efforts nothing in a london slum could have been worse than this evil which had come about in a gentleman's ornamental dairy upon premises where money had been lavished to secure the perfection of scientific sanitation mr porter murmured some hopeful remark as they went back to the house don't talk about it porter greswold answered impatiently nothing could be worse nothing do all you can for these poor people your uttermost mind your uttermost spare neither time nor money save them if you can you may be assured i shall do my best there are only three or four very bad cases three or four my god how horrible three or four people murdered by the idiocy of my servants joe stanning not much chance for him i'm afraid and polly rainbow polly poor little polly oh porter you must save her you must perform a miracle man that is what genius means in a doctor the man of genius does something that all other doctors have pronounced impossible you will have hutchinson over to-morrow he may be able to help you if she live till to-morrow i'm afraid it's a question of a few hours george greswold groaned aloud and my daughter has been drinking the same tainted milk will she be stricken do you think he asked with an awful calmness god forbid lola has such a fine constitution and the antecedent circumstances are different i'll go and have a look at my patients and come back to you late in the evening with the latest news they parted by a little gate at the corner of a thick yew hedge which admitted mr greswold into his wife's flower garden the very old garden which had been the care and delight of many generations a large square garden with broad flower beds on each side a stone sundial in the centre of a grass plot and a buttressed wall at the end a massive old wall of vermilion brickwork honeycombed by the decay of centuries against which a double rank of hollyhocks made a parti-coloured screen while flaunting dragon's mouth and yellow stone crop made a flame of colour on the top there was an old stone summer-house in each angle of that end wall temples open to the sun and air and raised upon three marble steps stained with moss and lichen charming as these antique retreats were to muse or read in mildred greswold preferred taking tea on the lawn in the shadow of the two old cedars she was sitting in a low garden chair with a japanese tea-table at her side and a volume of robertson's sermons on her lap it was a rule of life at enderby manor that only books of pious tendency should be read on sundays the sunday library was varied and well chosen nobody ever found the books dull or the day too long the dedication of that one day in seven to godliness and good works had never been an oppression to mildred greswold she remembered her mother's sundays days of hasty church and slow elaborate dressing for afternoon or evening gaieties days of church parade and much praise of other people's gowns and depreciation of other people's conduct days of gadding about and running from place to place sunday luncheons sunday musical parties sunday expeditions up the river sunday in the studios sunday at richmond or greenwich mrs greswold remembered the fussy emptiness of that fashionable sunday and preferred sermons and tranquil solitude in the manor gardens solitude meant a trinity of domestic love husband wife and daughter spent their sundays together those were blessed days for the wife and daughter since there were no business engagements no quarter sessions or interviews with the bailiff or letter-writing to rob them of the society they both loved best in the world george greswold devoted his sundays entirely to his creator and his home where is lola he asked surprised to find his wife alone at this hour she has a slight headache and i persuaded her to lie down for an hour or so the father's face blanched a word was enough in his overwrought condition porter must see her he said and i have just let him leave me i'll send some one after him my dear george it is nothing only one of her usual headaches 
you are sure she was not feverish i think not it never occurred to me she has often complained of headaches since she began to grow so fast yes she has shot up like a tall white lily my lily murmured the father tenderly he sank into a chair feeling helpless hopeless almost under that overpowering sense of fatality of undeserved evil dear george you look so ill this afternoon said his wife with a tender anxiety laying her hand on his shoulder and looking earnestly at him as he sat there in the downcast attitude his arms hanging loosely his eyes bent upon the ground i'm afraid the heat has overcome you yes it has been very hot do me a favour mildred go into the house and send somebody to find porter he was going the round of the cottages where there are sick people he can easily be found i want him to see lola at once i'll send after him george but indeed i don't see any need for a doctor lola is so strong her headaches pass like summer clouds oh george you don't think that she is going to have fever like the cottagers cried mildred full of sudden terror no no of course not why should she have the fever but porter might as well see her at once at once i hate delay in such cases his wife hurried away without a word he had imbued her with all his own fears he sat in the garden just as she had left him motionless benumbed with sorrow there might indeed be no ground for this chilling fear others might die and his beloved might still go unscathed but she had been subjected to the same poison and at any moment the same symptoms might show themselves for the next week or ten days he must be haunted by a hideous spectre he would make haste to get his dearest one away to the strong fresh mountain air to the salt breath of the german ocean but if the poison had already tainted that young life mountain and sea could not save her from the fever she must pass through the furnace as those others were passing poor little polly rainbow the only child of a widow the only one like mine he said to himself he sat in the garden till dusk brooding praying dumbly unutterably sad the image of the widow of nan was in his mind while he sat there the humble funeral train the mourning mother and that divine face shining out of the little group of peasant faces radiant with intellect and faith among them but not of them and the uplifted hand beckoning the dead man from the bier the age of miracles is past he thought there is no saviour in the land to help me in my day of darkness heaven made no sign i was left to suffer as the worms suffer under the ploughshare and to wriggle back to life as best i could like them it was growing towards the summer darkness when he rose and went into the house where he questioned the butler whom he met in the hall mr porter had been brought back and had seen miss greswold he had found her slightly feverish and had ordered her to go to bed mrs greswold was sitting with her did dr porter seem anxious no not at all anxious but he was going to send miss lola some medicine before bedtime it was after nine now but greswold could not stay in the house he wanted to know how it fared with his sick tenantry most of all with the little flaxen-haired girl he had so often noticed of late he went out into the road that led to the village a scattered colony a cottage here and there or a cluster of cottages and gardens on a bit of rising ground above the road there was a common little way from the manor a picturesque irregular expanse of hollows and hillocks skirted by a few cottages and with a fir plantation shielding it from the north mrs rainbow's cottage stood between the common and the fir wood on an old half-timbered cottage very low with a bedroom in the roof and a curious dormer window with a thatched arch projecting above the lattice like an overhanging eyebrow the little garden was aflame with scarlet bean blossom roses and geraniums and the perfume of sweet peas filled the air greswold heard the doctor talking in the upper chamber as he stood by the gate the deep grave tones were audible in the evening stillness and there was another sound that chilled the squire's heart the sound of a woman's suppressed weeping he waited at the gate he had not the nerve to go into the cottage and face that sorrowing widow it seemed to him as if the child's peril were his fault it was not enough that he had taken all reasonable precautions he ought to have foreseen the idiocy of his servants he ought to have been more on the alert to prevent evil the great round moon came slowly up out of a cluster of scotch firs how black the branches looked against that red light 
slowly slowly gliding upward in a slanting line the moon stole at the back of those black branches and climbed into the open sky how often lola had watched such a moonrise at his side and with what keen eyes she had noted the beauty of the spectacle it was not that he had trained her to observe and to feel the loveliness of nature with her that feeling had been an instinct born with her going before the wisdom of maturity the cultivated taste of travelled experience to-night she was lying in her darkened room the poor head heavy and painful on the pillow she would not see the moon rising slowly yonder in that cloudless sky no matter she will see it to-morrow i hope he said to himself trying to be cheerful i am a morbid fool to torment myself she has been subject to headaches of late mildred is right and then he remembered that death and sorrow were near close to him as he stood there watching the moon he remembered poor little polly rainbow and desponded again a woman's agonized cry broke the soft summer stillness and pierced george greswold's heart the child is dead he thought yes poor little polly was gone the widow came out to the gate presently sobbing piteously and clasped mr greswold's hand and cried over it broken down by her despair leaning against the gate-post as if her limbs had lost the power to bear her up oh sir she was my all she sobbed she was my all she could say no more than this but kept repeating it again and again she was all i had in the world the only thing i cared for george greswold touched her shoulder with protecting gentleness there was not a peasant in the village for whom he had not infinite tenderness pitying their infirmities forgiving their errors inexhaustible in benevolence towards them all he had set himself to make his dependents happy as the first duty of his position and yet he had done them evil unwittingly he had cost this poor widow her dearest treasure her one ewe lamb bear up if you can my good soul he said i know that it is hard oh sir you'd know it better if it was your young lady that was stricken down exclaimed the widow bitterly and the squire walked away from the cottage gate without another word yes he would know it better then his heart was heavy enough now what would it be like if she were smitten she was much the same next day languid with an aching head and some fever she was not very feverish on the whole the doctor was hopeful or he pretended to be so he could give no positive opinion yet nor could dr hutchinson they were both agreed upon that point and they were agreed that the polluted water in the garden well had been the cause of the village epidemic analysis had shown that it was charged with poisonous gas mr greswold hastened his preparations for the journey to scotland with a feverish eagerness he wrote to engage a sleeping carriage on the great northern they were to travel on thursday leaving home before noon dining in town and starting for the north in the evening if lola's illness were indeed the slight indisposition which everybody hoped it was she might be quite able to travel on thursday and the change of air and movement would do her good she is always so well in scotland said her father no there did not seem much amiss with her she was very sweet and even cheerful when her father went into her room to sit beside her bed for a quarter of an hour or so the doctors had ordered that she should be kept very quiet and a hospital nurse had been fetched from salisbury to sit up at night with her there was no necessity for such care but it was well to do even a little too much where so cherished a life was at stake people had but to look at the father's face to know how precious that frail existence was to him nor was it less dear to the mother but she seemed less apprehensive less bowed down by the gloomy forebodings yes lola was quite cheerful for those few minutes in which her father sat by her side the strength of her love overcame her weakness she forgot the pain in her head the weariness of her limbs while he was there she questioned him about the villagers how is little polly going on she asked he dared not tell the truth it would have hurt him too much to speak to her of death she is going on very well all is well love he said deceiving her for the first time in his life this was on tuesday and the preparations for scotland were still in progress mr greswold's talk with his daughter was all of their romantic highland home of the picnics and rambles the fishing excursions and sketching parties they would have there 
the nurse sat in a corner and listened to them with a grave countenance and would not allow mr greswold more than ten minutes with his daughter he counted the hours till they should be on the road for the north there would be the rest of tuesday and all wednesday she would be up and dressed on wednesday no doubt and on thursday morning the good old grey carriage horses would take them all off to ramsay station such a pretty drive on a summer morning by fields and copses with changeful glimpses of the silvery test dr hutchinson came on tuesday evening and found his patient not quite so well there was a long conference between the two doctors and then the nurse was called in to receive her instructions and then mr greswold was told that the journey to scotland must be put off for a fortnight at the very least he received the sentence as if it had been his death warrant he asked no questions he dared not a second nurse was to be sent over from southampton next morning the two doctors had the cool determined air of men who are preparing for a battle lola was light-headed next morning but with intervals of calmness and consciousness she heard the church bell tolling and asked what it meant it's for polly rainbow's funeral answered the maid who was tidying the room oh no cried lola that can't be father said she was better and then her mind began to wander and she talked of polly rainbow as if the child had been in the room talked of the little girl's lessons at the parish school and of a prize that she was to get after that all was darkness all was despair a seemingly inevitable progress from bad to worse science care love prayers all were futile and the bell that had tolled for the widow's only child tolled ten days afterwards for lola it seemed to george greswold as though slow strokes beat upon his brain heavily heavily like minute guns that all the hopes and cares and joys and expectations life had held for him were over his wife was on her knees in the darkened house from which the funeral train was slowly moving and he had loved her passionately and yet it seemed to him as if the open car yonder with its coffin hidden under snow-white blossoms was carrying away all that had ever been precious to him upon this earth she was the morning with its promise of day he said to himself she was the springtime with its promise of summer while i had her i lived in the future henceforward i can only live in the present i dare not look back upon the past chapter seven drifting apart george greswold and his wife spent the rest of that fatal year in a villa on the lake of thun an italian villa with a campanello tower and a long white colonnade and stone balconies overhanging lawn and gardens where the flowers grew in a riotous profusion the villa was midway between two of the boat stations and there was no other house near and this loneliness was its chief charm for those two heart-broken mourners they yearned for no sympathy they cared for no companionship hardly even for that of each other close as the bond of love had been till now each seemed to desire above all things to be alone with that great grief to hug that dear sad memory in silence and solitude only to see them from a distance from the boat yonder as it glided swiftly past that flowery lawn an observer would have guessed at sorrow and bereavement from the mere attitude of either mourner the man sitting with his head bent forward brooding on the ground the unread newspaper lying across his knee the woman on the other side of the lawn beyond speaking distance half reclining in a low basket chair with her hands clasped above her head gazing at the distant line of snow mountains in listless vacancy the huge tan-coloured st bernard snapping with his great cavern-like jaws at the infinitesimal flies was the only object that gave life to the picture the boats went by in sunshine and cloud the boats went by under torrential rain which seemed to fuse lake and mountains villas and gardens into one watery chaos the boats went by and the days passed like the boats and made no difference in the lives of those two mourners nothing could ever make any difference to either of them for evermore it seemed to mildred it was as if some spring had broken in the machinery of life even love seemed dead and yet he was once so fond of me and i of him thought the wife watching her husband's face with its curious look of absence the look of a window with the blind down there were times when that look of utter abstraction almost frightened mildred greswold it was an expression she had seen occasionally during her daughter's lifetime and which had always made her anxious it was the look about which lola used to say when they all met at the breakfast-table papa has had his bad dream again 
that bad dream was no invention of lola's but a stern reality in george greswold's life he would start up from his pillow in an agony muttering broken sentences in that voice of the sleeper which seems always different from his natural voice as if he belonged to another world cold beads of sweat would start out upon his forehead and the wife would put her arms round him and soothe him as a mother soothes her frightened child until the muttering ceased and he sank upon his pillow exhausted to lapse into quiet sleep or else awoke and recovered calmness in awakening the dream whatever it was always left its mark upon him next day it was a kind of nightmare he told his wife when she gently questioned him not urging her questions lest there should be pain in the mere recollection of that horrid vision he could give no graphic description of that dream it was all confusion a blurred and troubled picture but that confusion was in itself agony rarely were his mutterings intelligible rarely did his wife catch half a dozen consecutive words from those broken sentences but once she heard him say the cage the cage again iron bars like a wild beast and now that absent and cloudy look which she had seen in her husband's face after the bad dream was there often she spoke to him sometimes and he did not hear she repeated the same question twice or thrice in her soft low voice standing close beside him and he did not answer there were times when it was difficult to arouse him from that deep abstraction and at such times the utter blackness and solitude of her own life weighed upon her like a dead weight an almost unbearable burden what is to become of us both in all the long years before us she thought despairingly are we to be always far apart living in the same house spending all our days together and yet divided she had married before she was eighteen and at one and thirty was still in the bloom of womanhood younger than most women of that age for her life had been subject to none of those vicissitudes and fevers which age women of the world she had never kept a secret from her husband never trembled at opening a milliner's account or blushed at the delivery of a surreptitious letter the struggles for pre-eminence the social race in which some women waste their energies and strain their nerves were unknown to her she had lived at enderby manor as the flowers lived rejoicing in the air and the sunshine drinking out of a cup of life in which there mingled no drop of poison thus it was that not one line upon the transparent skin marked the passage of a decade the violet eyes had the limpid purity and the emotional lips had the tender carnation of girlhood mildred greswold was as beautiful at thirty-one as mildred fawcett had been at seventeen and yet it seemed to her that life was over and that her husband had ceased to care for her many and many an hour in that lovely solitude beside the lake she sat with hands loosely clasped in her lap or above her head with her books lying forgotten at her feet all the newest books that librarians could send to tempt the jaded appetite of the reader and her eyes gazing vacantly over the blue of the lake or towards the snow peaks on the horizon often in these silent musings she recalled the past and looked at the days that were gone as at a picture she remembered just such an autumn as this a peerless autumn spent with her father at the hook spent for the most part on the river and in the garden the sunny days and moonlit nights being far too lovely for any one to waste indoors her seventeenth birthday was not long past it was just ten years since she had come home to that house to find fay had vanished from it and to shed bitter tears for the loss of her companion never since that time had she seen fay's face her questions had been met coldly and angrily by her mother and even her father had answered her with unsatisfactory brevity all she could learn was that fay had been sent to complete her education at a finishing school at brussels at school oh poor fay i hope she is happy she ought to be mrs fawcett answered peevishly the school is horridly expensive i saw one of the bills the other day simply enormous the girls are taken to the opera and have all sorts of absurd indulgences still it is only school mother not home said mildred compassionately this was two years after fay had vanished no letter had ever come from her to mildred though mildred was able to write now in her own sprawling childish fashion and would have been delighted to answer any such letter she had herself indicted various epistles to her friend but had not succeeded in getting them posted they had drifted to the waste-paper basket mute evidences of wasted affection as each holiday time came round the child asked if fay were coming home 
always to receive the same saddening negative one day when she had been more urgent than usual mrs fawcett lost temper and answered sharply no she is not coming she is never coming i don't like her and i don't intend ever to have her in any house of mine so you may as well leave off plaguing me about her but mother why don't you like her never mind why i don't like her that is enough for you to know but mother if she is father's daughter and my sister you ought to like her pleaded mildred very much in earnest how dare you say that you must never say it again you are a naughty cruel child to say such things exclaimed mrs fawcett beginning to cry why naughty why cruel oh mother and mildred cried too she clasped her arms round her mother's neck and sobbed aloud dear mother indeed i am not naughty she protested but bell said fay was papa's daughter of course she's his daughter bell said and if she's father's daughter she's my sister and it's wicked not to love one sister the psalm i was learning yesterday says so mother behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity and it means sisters just the same miss colville said when i asked her and i do love fay i can't help loving her you must never speak her name again to me said mrs fawcett resolutely i shall leave off loving you if you pester me about that odious girl then wasn't it true what bell said of course not mother would it be wrong for papa to have a daughter asked mildred perplexed by this mysterious resentment for which she could understand no cause wrong it would be infamous would god be angry asked the child with an awe-stricken look would it be wicked it would be the worst possible insult to me said lord castle connell's daughter ignoring the minor question after this mildred refrained from all further speech about the absent girl to her mother but as the years went by she questioned her father from time to time as to fay's whereabouts she is very well off my dear you need not make yourself unhappy about her she is with a very nice family and has pleasant surroundings shall i never see her again father never's a long day mildred i'll take you to see her by and by when there is an opportunity you see it happens unfortunately that your mother does not like her so it is better she should not come here it would not be pleasant for her or for me he said this gravely with a somewhat dejected look and mildred felt somehow that even to him it would be better to talk no more of her lost companion as the years went by mrs fawcett changed from a woman of fashion to a nervous valetudinarian it was not that she loved pleasure less but her beauty and her health had both begun to dwindle and fade at an age when other women are in their prime she fretted at the loss of her beauty watched every wrinkle counted every grey hair lamented over every change in the delicate colouring which had been her chief charm how pretty you are growing mildred she exclaimed once with a discontented air when mildred was a tall slip of fourteen you are just what i was at your age and you will grow prettier every day until you are thirty and then i dare say you will begin to fade as i have done and feel an old woman as i do it seemed to her that her own charms dwindled as her daughter grew as the bud unfolded the flower faded she felt almost as if mildred had robbed her of her beauty she would not give up the pleasures and excitement of society she consulted half a dozen fashionable physicians and would not obey one of them they all prescribed the same repulsive treatment rest early hours country air with gentle exercise no parties no excitement no strong tea mrs fawcett disobeyed them all and from only fancying herself ill grew to be really ill and from chronic lassitude developed organic disease of the heart she lingered nearly two years a confirmed invalid suffering a good deal and giving other people a great deal of trouble she died soon after mildred's sixteenth birthday and on her deathbed she confided freely in her daughter who had attended upon her devotedly all through her illness neglecting everything else in the world for her mother's sake you are old enough to understand things that must once have seemed very mysterious to you mildred said mrs fawcett lying half hidden in the shadow of guipur bed curtains with her daughter's hand clasped in hers perhaps forgetting how young that daughter was in her own yearning for sympathy you couldn't make out why i disliked that horrid girl so much could you no indeed mother i hated her because she was your father's daughter mildred his natural daughter the child of some woman who was not his wife 
you are old enough now to know what that means you were reading the heart of midlothian to me last week you know mildred yes mildred knew she hung her head at the memory of that sad story and at the thought that her father might have sinned like george staunton yes mildred she was the child of some woman he loved before he married me he must have been desperately in love with the woman or he would never have brought her daughter into my house it was the greatest insult he could offer to me was it mother was it why of course it was how stupid you are child exclaimed the invalid peevishly and the feverish hand grew hotter as she talked mildred blushed crimson at the thought of this story of shame poor fay poor unhappy fay and yet her strong common sense told her that there were two sides to the question it was not fay's fault mother she said gently no one could blame fay or be angry with her and if the wicked woman was dead and father had repented and was sorry was it very wrong for him to bring my sister home to us don't call her your sister exclaimed mrs fawcett with a feeble scream of angry alarm she is not your sister she is no relation she is nothing to you it was an insult to bring her across my threshold you must be very stupid or you must care very little for me if you can't understand that his conduct proved that he had cared for that low common woman fay's mother more than he ever cared for me perhaps he thought her prettier than me said the invalid in hysterical parenthesis and i have never known a happy hour since oh mamma dear not in all the years when you used to wear such lovely gowns and go to so many parties protested the voice of common sense i only craved for excitement because i was miserable at heart i don't think you can half understand a wife's feelings mildred or you wouldn't say such foolish things i wanted you to know this before my death i want you to remember it always and if you meet that odious girl avoid her as you would a pestilence if your father should attempt to bring her here or to parchment street after i am gone he will not mother he will respect your wishes too much he will be too sorry exclaimed mildred bending down to kiss the hot dry hand and moistening it with her tears the year of mourning that began soon after this conversation was a very quiet interval for father and daughter they travelled a little spent six months in leipzig where mildred studied the piano under the most approved masters a couple of months in paris where her father showed her all the lions in a tranquil leisurely way that was very pleasant and then they went down to the hook and lived there in happy idleness on the river and in the gardens all through a long and lovely summer both were saddened at the sight of an empty chair one sacred corner in all the prettiest rooms where maud fawcett had been wont to sit a graceful languid figure robed in white or some pale delicate hue even more beautiful than white in contrast with the background of palms and flowers japanese screen or indian curtain how pretty she had looked sitting there with books and scent bottles and dainty satin lined basket full of some light frivolous work which progressed by stages of half a dozen stitches a day her fans her tennyson her palms and perfumes all had savoured of her own fragile bright-coloured loveliness she was gone and father and daughter were alone together deeply attached to each other yet with a secret between them a secret which made a darkening shadow across the lives of both whenever john fawcett wore a look of troubled thought mildred fancied he was brooding upon the past thinking of that erring woman who had borne him a child the child he had tried to fuse into his own family and to whom her own childish heart had yearned as to a sister it must have been instinct that made me love her she said to herself and then she would wonder idly what the fair sinner who had been fay's mother was like and whether her father had really cared more for that frail woman than for his lawful wife poor pretty mamma he seemed to dote upon her thought mildred i cannot imagine his ever having loved any one so well i cannot imagine his ever having cared for any other woman in this world the formless image of that unknown woman haunted the girl's imagination she appeared sometimes with one aspect sometimes another darkly beautiful of oriental type like scott's rebecca or fair and lowly born like effie deans poor fragile effie fated to fall at the first temptation poetry and fiction were full of suggestions about that unknown influence in her father's life but every thought of the past ended in a sigh of pity for that fair wife whose domestic happiness had been clouded over by that half-discovered mystery 
never a word did she breathe to her father upon this forbidden subject never a word to bell who was still at the head of affairs in both mr fawcett's houses and who looked like a grim and stony repository of family secrets End of chapter six and seven book one chapters eight and nine of the fatal three by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight such things were mildred had been motherless for a year when that new love began to grow which was to be stronger and closer than the love of mother or father and which was to take possession of her life hereafter and transplant her to a new soil how well she remembered that summer afternoon on which she and george greswold met for the first time she a girl of seventeen fresh simple-minded untainted by that life of fashion and frivolity which she had seen only from the outside looking on as a child at the follies of men and women he her senior by thirteen years and serious beyond his age her father and his father had been companions at the university as undergraduates with full purses and a mutual delight in fox-hunting and tandem-driving it was this old oxford friendship which was the cause of george greswold's appearance at the hook on that particular summer afternoon mr fawcett had met him on a houseboat at henley regatta had been moved by the memory of the past on discovering that greswold was the son of george ransom of magdalen and had brought his friend's son home to introduce to his daughter it was not altogether without ulterior thought perhaps that he introduced george greswold into his home he had a theory that the young men of this latter day were for the most part a weak-kneed and degenerate race and it had seemed to him that this tall broad-shouldered young man with the marked features dark eyes and powerful brow was of a stronger type than the average bachelor a pity that he is rather too old for mildred he said to himself supposing that his daughter would hardly feel interested in a man who was more than five-and-twenty mildred could recall his face as she saw it for the first time to-day in her desolation sitting idly beside the lake while the rhythmical beat of the paddle-wheels died away in the distance that grave dark face impressed her at once with a sense of power she did not think the stranger handsome or fascinating or aristocratic or elegant but she thought of him a great deal and she was silent and shy in his presence let him come as often as he might he was in mourning for his mother to whom he had been deeply attached and who had died within the last three months leaving him enderby manor and a large fortune his home life had not been happy there had been an antagonism between him and his father from his boyhood upwards and he had shaken the dust of the paternal house off his feet and had left england to wander aimlessly living on a small income allowed him by his mother and making a little money by literature he was a second son a person of no importance except to the mother who doted on him happily for this younger son his mother was a woman of fortune and on her death george ransom inherited enderby manor the old house in which generations of greswolds had come and gone since dutch william was king of england there had been a much older house pulled down to make room for that red brick mansion and the greswolds had been lords of the soil since the wars of the roses red rose to the heart's core and loyal to an unfortunate king whether plantagenet tudor or stuart by the conditions of his mother's will george ransom assumed her family name and arms and became george ransom greswold in all legal documents henceforward but he signed himself george greswold and was known to his friends by that name he had not loved his father nor his father's race he came to the hook often in that glorious summer weather at the first he was grave and silent and seemed depressed by sad memories but this seemed natural in one who had so lately lost a beloved parent gradually the ice melted and his manner brightened he came without being bidden he contrived to make himself as it were a member of the family whose appearance surprised nobody he bought a steam launch which was always at mr fawcett's disposal and miss fawcett went everywhere with her father she recalled those sunlit days now with every impression of the moment the ever-growing sense of happiness the silent delight in knowing herself beloved the deepening reverence for the man who loved her the limitless faith in his power of heart and brain the confiding love which felt a protection in the very sound of his voice yes those had been happy days the rosy dawning of a great joy that was to last until the grave mildred fawcett had thought and now after thirteen years of wedded love they had drifted apart sorrow which should have drawn them nearer together had served only to divide them 
oh my lamb if you could know in your heavenly home how much your loss has cost us thought the mother with the image of that beloved child before her eyes there had been a gloomy reserve in george greswold's grief which had held his wife at a distance and had wounded her sorrowful heart he was selfish in his sorrow forgetting that her loss was as great as his he had bowed his head before inexorable fate had sat down in dust and ashes and brooded over his bereavement solitary despairing if he did not curse god in his anguish it was because early teaching still prevailed and the habits of thought he had learned in childhood were not lightly to be flung off upon one side of his character he was a pagan seeing in this affliction the hand of nemesis the blind avenger they left switzerland in the late autumn and wintered in vienna where mr greswold gave himself up to study and where neither he nor his wife took any part in the gaieties of the capital here they lived until the spring and then even in the depths of his gloom a yearning came upon george greswold to see the home of his race the manner which he had loved as if it were a living thing mildred do you think you could bear to be in the old home again he asked his wife suddenly one morning at breakfast i could bear anything better than the life we lead here she answered her eyes filling with tears we will go back then yes even if it is only to look upon our daughter's grave they went back to england and to enderby manor within a week after that conversation they arrived at romsey station one bright may afternoon and found the grey horses waiting to carry them to the old house how sad and strange it seemed to be coming home without lola she had always been their companion on such journeys and her eager face and glad young voice on the alert to recognize the first familiar points of the landscape hilltop or tree or cottage that indicated home had given an air of gaiety to everyday life the old horses took them back to the manor but not the old coachman a great change in the household had come about after lola's funeral george greswold had been merciless to those servants whose carelessness had brought about that great calamity which made seven new graves in the churchyard before all was done he dismissed his bailiff mrs wadman and her husband and under dairymaid and a cowman and his housekeeper all of whom he considered accountable for the use of that foul water from the old well accountable inasmuch as they had given him no notice of the evil and had exercised no care or common sense in their management of the dairy these he dismissed sternly and that party feeling which rules among servants took this severity amiss and several other members of the household gave warning let it be a clean sweep then said mr greswold to bell who announced the falling away of his old servants let there be none of the old faces here when we come back next year except yours there will be plenty of time for you to get new people a clean sweep suited bell's temper admirably to engage new servants who should owe their places to her and bow themselves down before her was a delight to the old irishwoman thus it was that all things had a strange aspect when mildred greswold re-entered her old home even the rooms had a different air the new servants had arranged the furniture upon new lines not knowing that old order which had been a part of daily life let us go and look at her rooms first said mildred softly and husband and wife went silently to the rooms in the south wing the octagon room with its dwarf bookcases and bright bindings its proof engravings after landseer pictures chosen by lola herself here nothing was changed bell's own hands had kept all things in order no unfamiliar touch had disturbed the relics of the dead mrs greswold stayed in that once happy scene for nearly an hour it was hard to realize that she and her daughter were never to be together again they who had been almost inseparable who had sat side by side by yonder window or yonder hearth in all the changes of the seasons there was the piano at which they had played and sung together the music-stand still contained the prettily bound volumes sonatinas by hummel and clemanti easy duets by mozart national melodies a volkslieder in music the child had been in advance of her years with the mother music was a passion and she had imbued her daughter with her own tastes in all things the child's nature had been a carrying on and completing of the mother's character a development of all the mother's gifts she was gone and the mother's life seemed desolate and empty the future a blank never in her life had she so much needed her husband's love active considerate sympathetic and yet never had he seemed so far apart from her it was not that he was unkind or neglectful 
it was only that his heart made no movement towards hers he was not in sympathy with her he had wrapped himself in his grief as in a mantle he stood aloof from her and seemed never to have understood that her sorrow was as great as his own he left her on the threshold of lola's room it might be that he could not endure the sight of those things which she had looked at weeping in an ecstasy of grief to her that agony of touch and memory the aspect of things that belonged to the past seemed to bring her lost child nearer to her it was as if she stretched her hands across the gulf and touched those vanished hands poor piano she sighed poor piano that she loved she touched the keys softly playing the opening bars of la sidara em la mano it was the first melody they had played together mother and child arranged easily as a duet later they had sung it together the girl's voice clear as a bird's and seeming to need training no more than a bird's voice these things had been and were all over what shall i do with my life cried the mother despairingly what shall i do with all the days to come now she is gone she left those rooms at last locking the doors behind her and went out into the garden the grand old cedars cast their broad shadows on the lawn the rustic chairs and tables were there as in the days gone by when that velvet turf under the cedars had been mrs greswold's summer parlour would she sit there ever again she wondered could she endure to sit there without lola there was a private way from the manor gardens into the churchyard a short cut to church by which mother and daughter had gone twice on every sunday ever since lola was old enough to know what sunday meant she went by this path in the evening stillness to visit lola's grave she gathered a few rosebuds as she went flowers for my blighted flower she murmured softly all was still and solemn in the old churchyard shadowed by sombre yews a churchyard of irregular levels and moss-grown monuments enclosed by rusty iron railings and humbler headstones of crumbling stone covered over with an orange-coloured lichen which was like vegetable rust the names on these were for the most part illegible the lettering of a fashion that has passed away but here and there a brand new stone perked itself up among these old memorials with an assertive statement about the dead lola's grave was marked by a large white marble cross carved in alto relievo on the level slab the inscription was of the simplest lola the only child of george and mildred greswold aged twelve there were no words of promise or of consolation upon the stone on one side of the grave there was a large mountain ash whose white blossoms and delicate leaves made a kind of temple above the marble slab on the other an ancient yew cast its denser shade mildred knelt down in the shadow and let her head droop over the cold stone there was a skylark singing in the blue vault high above the old norman tower a carol of joy and glad young life as it seemed to mildred sitting in the dust what a mockery that joyousness of springtime and nature seemed she knew not how long she had knelt there in silent grief when the branches rustled suddenly as if a strong arm had parted them and a man flung himself down heavily upon a turf-covered mound a neglected nameless grave beside lola's monument she did not stir from her kneeling attitude or lift her head to look at the newcomer knowing that the mourner was her husband she had heard his footsteps approaching heavy and slow in the stillness of the place the trunk of the tree hid her from that other mourner as she knelt there he thought himself alone and in the abandonment of that fancied solitude he groaned aloud as job may have groaned sitting among ashes judgment he cried judgment and then after an interval of silence he cried again judgment that one word so repeated seemed to freeze all the blood in her veins what did it mean that exceeding bitter cry judgment chapter nine the face in the church two months have gone by since that first visit to lola's grave when the husband and wife had knelt so near each other and yet so far apart in the infinite mystery of human consciousness he with his secret thoughts and secret woes which she had never fathomed he unaware of her neighbourhood she chilled by a vague suspicion and sense of estrangement which had been growing upon her ever since her daughter's death it was summer again the rife full-blown summer of mid-july the awful anniversary of their bereavement had passed in silence and prayer all things at enderby looked as they had looked in the years that were gone 
except the faces of the servants which were for the most part strange that change of the household made a great change in life to people so conservative as george greswold and his wife and the old home seemed so much less like home because of that change the squire of enderby felt that his popularity was lessened in the village for which he had done so much his severe dealing with the offenders had pleased nobody not even the sufferers from the epidemic whose losses he had avenged he had shown himself implacable and there were many who said he had been unjust it was hard upon wadman and his wife to be turned off after twenty years faithful service said one of the villagers the squire may go a long way before he'll get as good a bailiff as thomas said another for the first time since he had inherited the estate george greswold felt himself surrounded by an atmosphere of discontent and even dislike his tenants seemed afraid of him and were reticent and moody when he talked to them which he did much seldomer than of old making a great effort in order to appear interested in their affairs mildred's life during those summer weeks while the roses were opening and all the flowers succeeding each other in a procession of loveliness had drifted along with a slow dull stream that crawls through a desolate swamp there was neither beauty nor colour in her existence there was a sense of vacuity an aching void nothing to hope for nothing to look back upon she did not abandon herself slavishly to her sorrow she tried to resume the life of duty which had once been so full of sweetness so rich in its rewards for every service she went about among the cottagers as of old she visited the shabby gentilities on the fringe of the market town the annuitants and struggling families the poor widows and elderly spinsters who had quite as much need of help as the cottagers and whom it had always been her delight to encourage and sustain with friendliness and sympathy as well as with delicate benefactions gifts that never humiliated the recipient she took up the thread of her work in the parish schools she resumed her old interest in the church services and decorations in the inevitable charity bazaar or organ fund concert she played her part in the parish so well that people began to say mrs greswold is getting over her loss in him the shock had left a deeper mark his whole aspect was changed he looked ten years older than before the coming of sorrow and though people loved her better they pitied him more she has more occupations and pursuits to interest her said mr rawlinson the curate she is devoted to music and that employs her mind yes music was her passion but in these days of mourning every music was allied to pain every melody she played every song she sang recalled the child whose appreciation of that divine art had been far beyond her years they had sung and played together often singing alone in the summer dusk in that corner of the long drawing-room where lola's babyish chair still stood she had started fancying she heard that other voice mingling with her own the sweet clear tones which had sounded seraphic even upon earth oh was she with the angels now or was it all a fable that fond vision of a fairer world and an angelic choir singing before the great white throne to have lost such a child was almost to believe in the world of seraphim and cherubim of angels and purified spirits where else could she be husband and wife lived together side by side in a sad communion that seemed to lack the spirit of unity the outward semblance of confiding affection was there but there was something wanting he was very good to her as kind as attentive and considerate as in their first year of marriage and yet there was something wanting she remembered what he had been when he came as a stranger to the hook and it seemed to her as if the glass of time had turned backwards for fourteen years and that he was again as he had been in those early days when she had watched him curiously interested in his character as in a mystery he was too grave for a man of his years and with a shade of gloom upon him that hinted at a more than common grief he had been subject to lapses of abstraction as if his mind had slipped back to some unhappy past it was only when he had fallen in love and was wholly devoted to her that the shadow passed away and he began to feel the joyousness of life and the fervour of ardent hopes then the old character dropped off him like the serpent's slough and he became as young as the youngest boyish even in his frank felicity this memory of her first impressions about him was so strong with her that she could not help speaking of it one evening after dinner when she had been playing one of beethoven's grandest adagios to him and they were sitting in silence she by the piano 
he far away by an open window on a level with the shadowy lawn where the great cedars rose black against the pale grey sky george do you remember my playing that adagio to you the first time i remember you better than beethoven i could scarcely think of the music in those days for thinking so much of you ah but the first time you heard me play that adagio was before you had begun to care for me before you had cast your slough what do you mean before you had come out of your cloud of sad memories when first you came to us you lived only in the past i doubt if you were more than half conscious of our existence she could only distinguish his profile faintly defined against the evening grey as he sat beside the window had she seen the expression of his face its look of infinite pain she would hardly have pursued the subject i had but lately lost my mother he said gravely ah but that was a grief which you did not hide from us you did not shrink from our sympathy there there was some other trouble something that belonged to a remoter past over which you brooded in secret yes george i know you had some secrets then that divided us and and falteringly with tears in her voice i think those old secrets are keeping us under now when our grief should draw us nearer together she had left her place by the piano and had gone to him as she spoke and now she was on her knees beside him clinging to him tearfully george trust me love me she pleaded my beloved do i not love you he protested passionately clasping her in his arms kissing away her tears soothing her as if she had been a child my dearest and best from the first hour i wakened to a new life in your love my truth has never wavered my heart has never known change and yet you are changed since our darling went terribly changed do you wonder that i grieve for her no but you grieve apart you hold yourself aloof from me if i do it is because i do not want you to share my burden mildred your sorrow may be cured perhaps mine never can be time may be merciful to you for me time can do nothing dearest what hope can there be for me that you do not share the christian's hope of meeting our loved one hereafter i have no other hope i hardly know if i have that hope he answered slowly with deepest despondency and yet you are a christian if to endeavour to follow christ the teacher and friend of humanity is to be a christian yes and you believe in the world to come i try so to believe mildred i try faith in the kingdom of heaven does not come easily to a man whose life has been ruled by the inexorable fates not a word darling let us not talk of these things we know no more than socrates knew in his dungeon no more than roger bacon knew in his old age unheard buried forgotten never doubt my love dearest that is changeless you and lola were the sunshine of my life you shall be my sunshine henceforward i have been selfish in brooding over my sorrow but it is the habit of my mind to grieve in silence forgive me dear wife forgive me he clasped her in his arms and again she felt assured of her husband's affection but she knew all the same that there was some sorrow in his past life which he had kept hidden from her which he meant her never to know many a time in their happy married life she had tried to lead him to talk of his boyhood and youth about his days at eton and oxford he was frank enough but he was curiously reticent about his home life and about those years which he had spent travelling over the continent after he had left his father's house for good i was not happy at home mildred he told her one day my father and i did not get on together as the phrase goes he was very fond of my elder brother they had the same way of thinking about most things randolph's marriage pleased my father and he looked to randolph to strengthen the position of our family which had been considerably reduced by his own extravagance he would have liked my mother's estate to have gone to the elder son but she had full disposing power and she made me the heir this set my father against me and there came a time when dearly as i loved my mother i found that i could no longer live at home i went out into the world a lonely man and i only came back to the old home after my father's death this was the fullest account of his family history that george greswold had given his wife from his reserve in speaking of his father she divined that the balance of wrong had been upon the side of the parent rather than of the son had a man of her husband's temper been the sinner he would have frankly confessed his errors 
of his mother he spoke with undeviating love and he seemed to have been on friendly terms with his brother on the morning after that tearful talk in the twilight mr greswold startled his wife from a pensive reverie as they sat at breakfast in the garden they always breakfasted out of doors on fine summer mornings they had made no change in old customs since their return as some mourners might have done hoping to blunt the keen edge of memory by an alteration in the details of life both knew too well how futile any such alteration of their surroundings would be they remembered lola no more vividly at enderby than they had remembered her in switzerland my dearest i have been thinking of you incessantly since last night and of the loneliness of your life george greswold began seriously as he sat in a low basket chair sipping his coffee with his favourite setter cassandra at his feet an irish dog that had been famous for feather in days gone by but who had insinuated herself into the family affections and had got herself accepted as a household companion to the ruin of her sporting qualities cassandra went no more with the guns her place was in the drawing-room or the lawn i can never be lonely george while i have you there is no other company i can ever care about henceforward let me always be the first dear but you should have female companionship of some kind our house is empty and voiceless there should be some young voice some young footstep do you mean that i ought to hire a girl to run up and down stairs and laugh in the corridors as lola used oh george how can you exclaimed mildred beginning to cry no no dear i had no such thought in mind i was thinking of randolph's daughter you seemed to like her when she and her sister were here two years ago yes she was a nice bright girl then and my darling was pleased with her how merry they were together playing battledore and shuttlecock over there by the yew hedge don't ask me ever to see that girl again george it would make my heart ache i am sorry to hear you say that mildred i was going to ask you to have her here on a good long visit now that rosalind is married pamela has no home of her own rosalind and her husband like having her occasionally for a month or six weeks at a time but sir henry mountford's house is not pamela's home she would soon begin to feel herself an incubus the mountfords are very fond of society and just a little wordly they would soon be tired of a girl whose presence was no direct advantage i have been thinking that with us pamela would never be in the way you need not see too much of her in this big house there would be plenty of room for her to carry on her own pursuits and amusements without boring you and when you wanted her she would be at hand a bright companionable girl who would grow fonder of you every day i could not endure her fondness i could not endure any girl's companionship her presence would only remind me of my loss dearest i thought we were both agreed that as nothing can make us forget our darling it cannot matter to us how often we are reminded of her yes by silent unreasoning things like cassandra touching the dog's tawny head with a caressing hand or the garden the trees and flowers she loved her books her piano those things may remind us of our darling without hurting us but to hear a girl's voice calling me as she used to call me from the garden on summer mornings to hear a girl's laughter yes it would be painful love at first i can understand that mildred but if you can benefit an orphan girl by having her here i know your kind heart will not refuse let her come for a few weeks and if her presence pains you she shall stay no longer she shall not be invited again i would not ask you to receive a stranger but my brother's daughter is near me in blood let her come george said mildred impulsively i am very selfish thinking only of my own feelings let her come how strangely this talk of ours reminds me of something that happened when i was a child what was that mildred you have heard me speak of fay my playfellow yes i remember the evening my father asked mamma to let her come to us it seemed just now as if you were using his very words and yet all things were different mildred had told him very little about that childish sorrow of hers she had shrunk from any allusion to the girl whose existence bore witness against her father she too fond and frank as she was had kept her own counsel had borne the burden of a secret yes i have heard you speak of the girl you called fay and of whom you must have been very fond for the tears came into your eyes when you mentioned her did she live with you long oh no a very short time she was sent to school to a finishing school at brussels brussels he repeated with a look of surprise yes 
do you know anything about brussels schools nothing personally i have heard of girls educated there and what became of your playfellow after the brussels school i never heard and you never tried to find out yes i asked my mother but there was a prejudice in her mind against poor fay i would rather not talk about her george her vivid blush her evident confusion perplexed her husband there was some kind of mystery it seemed some family trouble in the background or mildred who was all candour would have spoken more freely then may i really invite pamela he asked after a brief silence during which he had responded to the endearments of cassandra too well fed to have any design upon the dainties on the breakfast-table and only asking to be loved i will write to her myself george where is she not very far off she is at cowes with the montfords on board sir henry's yacht the gadfly you had better send your letter to the post-office mart gadfly the invitation was dispatched by the first post miss greswold was asked to come to the manor as soon as she liked and to stay till the autumn the next day was sunday and mr and mrs greswold went to church together by the path that led them within a few paces of lola's grave for the first time since her daughter's death mildred had put on a light gown till to-day she had worn only black this morning she came into the vivid sunlight in a pale grey gown of soft lustreless silk and a neat little grey straw bonnet which set off the fairness of her skin and the sheen of her golden hair the simple fashion of her gown became her tall slim figure which had lost none of the grace of girlhood she was the prettiest and most distinguished-looking woman in enderby church although there were more county families represented there upon that particular sunday than are often to be seen in a village church the manor-house pew was on one side of the chancel and commanded a full view of the nave the first lesson was long and while it was being read mildred's eyes wandered idly along the faces in the nave recognizing countenances that had been familiar to her ever since her marriage until that wandering gaze stopped suddenly arrested by a face that was strange she saw this strange face between other faces as it were in a cleft in the block of people she saw it at the end of a vista with the sunlight from the chancel window full upon it a face that impressed her as no face of a stranger had ever done before it looked like the face of judas she thought and then in the next moment was ashamed of her fancy it is only the colouring and the effect of the light upon it she told herself i am not so weak as to cherish the vulgar prejudice against that coloured hair that coloured hair was of the colour which a man's enemies call red and his friends auburn or chestnut it was of that ruddy brown which titian has immortalized in more than one venus and without which potiphar's wife would be a nonentity the stranger wore a small pointed beard of this famous colouring his eyes were of a reddish brown large and luminous his eyebrows strongly arched his nose was a small aquiline his brow was wide and lofty slightly bald in front his mouth was the only obviously objectionable feature the lips were finely moulded from a greek sculptor's standpoint and would have done for a greek bacchus but the expression was at once crafty and sensual the auburn moustache served to accentuate rather than to conceal that repellent expression mildred looked at him presently as he stood up for the te deum he was tall for she saw his head well above intervening heads he looked about five-and-thirty he had the air of being a gentleman whoever he is i hope i shall never see him again thought mildred End of chapters eight and nine book one chapter ten of the fatal three by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten there is always the skeleton when mr and mrs greswold left the church the stranger was taking his place in the hillersdon wagonette a capacious vehicle drawn by a pair of upstanding black-brown horses set off by servants in smart liveries of dark brown and gold mildred gave a sigh of relief if the stranger was a visitor at riverdale it was not likely that he would stay long in the neighbourhood or be seen again for years to come the guests at riverdale were generally birds of passage and the same faces seldom appeared there twice mr and mrs hillersdon of riverdale were famous for their extensive circle and famous for bringing new people into the county 
some of their neighbours said it was mr hillersdon who brought the people there and that mrs hillersdon had nothing to do with the visiting list others declared that husband and wife were equally fickle and equally frivolous riverdale was one of the finest houses within ten miles of romsey and it was variously described by the local gentry it was called a delightful house or it was called a curious house according to the temper of the speaker its worst enemy could not deny that it was a splendid house spacious architectural luxurious with all the appendages of wealth and dignity nor could its worst enemy deny its merit as one of the most hospitable houses in the county notwithstanding this splendour and lavish hospitality the local magnates did not go to riverdale and the hillerdons were not received in some of the best houses tom hillersdon was a large landowner a millionaire and a man of good family but tom hillersdon was considered to have stranded himself in middle life by a marriage which in the outer world was spoken of vaguely as unfortunate but which the straight-laced among his neighbours considered fatal no man who had so married could hold up his head among his friends any more no man who had so married could hope to have his wife received in decent people's houses in spite of which opinion prevailing among tom hillersdon's oldest friends mrs hillersdon contrived to gather a good many people round her and some of them the most distinguished in the land she had cabinet ministers men of letters and famous painters among her guests she had plenty of women friends of a sort attractive women intellectual and enlightened women sober matrons bread and butter girls women who doted on mrs hillersdon and strange to say had never heard her history and yet hillersdon's wife had a history scarcely less famous than that of cleopatra or nell gwynne louise hillersdon was once louise lorraine the young adventuress whose irish grey eyes had set all london talking when the great exhibition of sixty two was still a monstrous iron skeleton and when south kensington was in its infancy louise lorraine's extravagance and louise lorraine's devotees from german princes and english dukes downwards had been town talk her box at the opera had been the cynosure of every eye and paris ran mad when she drove in the bois or exhibited her diamonds in the rue le pelletier or supped in the small hours at the cafe de paris with the topmost strawberries in the basket numerous and conflicting were the versions of her early history the more sensational chronicles describing her as the aphrodite of the gutter some people declared that she could neither read nor write and could not stir without her amanuensis at her elbow others affirmed that she spoke four languages and read a greek play or a chapter of thucydides every night with her feet on the fender while her maid brushed her hair the sober truth lay midway between these extremes she was the daughter of a doctor in a line regiment she was eminently beautiful very ignorant and very clever she wrote an uneducated hand never read anything better than a sentimental novel sang prettily and could accompany her songs on the guitar with a good deal of dash and fire to this may be added that she was an adept in the art of dress had as much tact and finesse as a leader of the old french noblesse and more audacity than a parisian cocotte in the golden age of coquetry such she was when tom hillersdon wiltshire squire and millionaire swooped like an eagle upon his fair dove and bore her off to his eyrie there was howling and gnashing of teeth among those many admirers who were all thinking seriously about making the lovely louise a bona fide offer and it was felt in a certain set that tom hillersdon had done a valiant and victorious deed but his country friends were of one accord in the idea that hillersdon had wrecked himself for ever the squire's wife came to riverdale and established herself there with as easy an air as if she had been a duchess she gave herself no trouble about the county families london was near enough for the fair louise and she filled her house or tom hillersdon filled it with relays of visitors from the great city scarcely had she been settled there a week when the local gentry were startled at seeing her sail into church with one of the most famous english statesmen in her train upon the sunday after she was attended by a great painter and a well-known savant and besides these she had a pew full of smaller fry a lady novelist a fashionable actor a celebrated queen's council and a county member where does she get those men asked lady marjorie danefield the conservative member's wife surely they can't all be reminiscences it had been supposed while the newly wedded couple were on their honeymoon that the lady's arrival at riverdale would inaugurate a reign of profanity 
that sunday would be given over to bohemian society cafe chantant songs champagne and cigarette smoking great was the surprise of the locality therefore when mrs hillersdon appeared in the squire's pew on sunday morning neatly dressed demure nay with an aspect of more than usual sanctity greater still the astonishment when she reappeared in the afternoon and listened meekly to the catechizing of the school-children and to the baptism of a refractory baby greater even yet when it was found that these pious practices were continued that she never missed a saint's day service that she had morning prayers for family and household and that she held meetings of an evangelical character in her drawing-room meetings at which curates from outlying parishes gathered like a flock of crows and at which the excellence of the tea and coffee pound cake and muffins speedily became known to the outside world happily for tom hillersdon these pious tendencies did not interfere with his amusements or the pleasantness of his domestic life riverdale was enlivened by a perennial supply of lively or interesting people notoriety of some kind was a passport to the hillersdon's favour it was an indication that a man was beginning to make his mark when he was asked to riverdale when he had made his mark he might think twice about going riverdale was the paradise of budding celebrities so to-day seeing the stranger get into the hillersdon wagonette mrs greswold opined that he was a man who had made some kind of reputation he could not be an actor with that beard he was a painter perhaps she thought he looked like a painter the wagonette was full of well-dressed women and well-bred men all with an essentially metropolitan or cosmopolitan air the eighteen carat stamp of county was obviously deficient mrs hillersdon had her own carriage a barouche which she shared with an elderly lady who looked as correct as if she had been a bishop's wife she was on bowing terms with mrs greswold they had met at hunt balls and charity bazaars and at various other functions from which the wife of a local landowner can hardly be excluded even when she has a history mildred thought no more of the auburn-haired stranger after the wagonette had disappeared in a cloud of summer dust she strolled slowly home with her husband by a walk which they had been in the habit of taking on fine sundays after morning service but which they had never trodden together since lola's death it was a round which skirted the common and took them past a good many of the cottages and their tenants had been wont to loiter at their gates on fine sundays in the hope of getting a passing word with the squire and his wife there had been something patriarchal or clannish in the feeling between landlord and tenant labourer and master which can only prevail in a parish where the chief landowner spends the greater part of his life at home to-day every one was just as respectful as of old curtsies were as low and tones as reverential but george greswold and his wife felt there was a difference all the same a gulf had been cleft between them and their people by last summer's calamity it was not the kindred of the dead in whom this coolness was distinguishable the bereaved seemed drawn nearer to their squire by an affliction which had touched him too but in enderby parish there was a bond of kindred which seemed to interlink the whole population there were not above three family names in the village and everybody was everybody else's cousin when not a nearer relative thus in dismissing his bailiff and dairy people mr greswold had given umbrage to almost all his cottagers he was no longer regarded as a kind master a man who could dismiss a servant after twenty years faithful service was in the estimation of enderby parish a ruthless tyrant a master whose yoke galled every shoulder him seem to be so fond of we all said luke thomas the village wheelwright brother of that john thomas who had been mr greswold's bailiff and who was now dreeing his weird in canada and yet offend he and him can turn and sack yer as if yer were a thief sweep yer off his premises like a handful of rubbish faithful service don't count with he george greswold felt the change from friendly gladness to cold civility he could see the altered expression in all those familiar faces the only sign of affection was from mrs rainbow standing at her cottage gate in decent black with sunken cheeks worn pale by many tears she burst out crying at sight of mildred greswold and clasped her hand in a fervour of sympathy oh to think of your sweet young lady ma'am that you should lose her as i lost my polly she sobbed and the two women wept together sisters in affliction you don't think we are to blame do you mrs rainbow 
mildred said gently no no indeed ma'am we all know it was god's will we must kiss the rod what fatalists these people are said greswold as he and his wife walked homeward by the sweet-smelling common where the heather showed purple here and there and where the harebells were beginning to dance upon the wind yes it is god's will but the name of that god is nemesis husband and wife were almost silent during luncheon both were depressed by that want of friendliness in those who had been to them as familiar friends to have forfeited confidence and affection was hard when they had done so much to merit both mildred could but remember how she and her golden-haired daughter had gone about amongst those people caring for all their needs spiritual and temporal never approaching them from the standpoint of superiority but treating them verily as friends she recalled long autumn afternoons in the village reading-room when she and lola had presided over a bevy of matrons and elderly spinsters she reading aloud to them while they worked lola threading needles to save elderly eyes sewing on buttons indefatigable in giving help of all kinds to these village sempstresses she had fancied that those mothers meetings the story-books and the talk had brought them all into a bond of affectionate sympathy and yet one act of stern justice seemed to have cancelled all obligations mr greswold lighted a cigar after lunch and went for a ramble in those extensive copses which were one of the charms of enderby manor miles and miles of woodland walks dark and cool in the hottest day of summer lonely footpaths where the master of enderby could think his own thoughts without risk of coming face to face with any one in that leafy solitude the enderby copses were cherished rather for pleasure than for profit and were allowed to grow a good deal higher and a good deal wilder and thicker than a young wood upon neighbouring estates mildred went to the drawing-room and to her piano after her husband her chief companion and confidant now that lola was gone music was her passion the only art that moved her deeply and to sit alone wandering from number to number of beethoven and mozart bach or mendelssohn was the very luxury of loneliness adhering in all things to the rule that sunday was not as other days she had her library of sacred music apart from other volumes and it was sacred music only which she played on sundays her repertoire was large and she roamed at will among the classic masters of the last two hundred years but for sacred music bach and mozart were her favourites she was playing a gloria by the latter composer when she heard a carriage drive past the windows and looked up just in time to catch a glimpse of a profile that startled her with a sudden sense of strangeness and familiarity the carriage was a light tea-cart driven by a groom in a hillersden livery a visitor from riverdale was a novelty for although george greswold and tom hillersden were friendly in the hunting field riverdale and the manor were not on visiting terms the visit was for her husband mildred concluded and she went on playing the door was opened by the new footman who announced mr castellani mrs greswold rose from the piano to find herself face to face with the man whose countenance seen in the distance in the light of the east window had reminded her of judas seen as she saw him now in the softer light of the afternoon standing before her with a deprecating air in her own drawing-room the stranger looked altogether different and she thought he had a pleasing expression he was tall and slim well dressed in a subdued metropolitan style and he had an air of distinction and elegance which would have marked him anywhere as a creature apart from the common herd it was not an english manner there was a supple grace in his movements which suggested a southern origin there was a pleading look in the full brown eyes which suggested an emotional temperament an italian no doubt thought mildred taking this southern gracefulness in conjunction with the southern name she wondered on what pretence this stranger had called and what could be his motive for coming mrs greswold i have to apologize humbly for presenting myself without having first sent you my credentials and waited for your permission to call he said in very perfect english with only the slightest milanese accent and then he handed mrs greswold an unsealed letter which he had taken from his breast pocket she glanced at it hastily not a little embarrassed by the situation the letter was from an intimate friend an amateur littérateur who wrote graceful sonnets and gave pleasant parties i need not excuse myself my dear friend for making mr castellani known to you in the flesh as i have no doubt he is already familiar to you in the spirit 
he is the anonymous author of nepenthe the book that almost every one has been reading and quite every one has been talking about this season only the few can understand it but you are of those few and i feel assured your deepest feelings have been stirred by that most exceptional work how delicious it must be with you among green lanes and english meadows we are just rushing off to a land of extinct volcanoes for my poor husband's annual cure a vous de coeur diana tomkison pray sit down said mildred as she finished her gushing friend's note my husband will be in presently i hope in time to see you pardon me if in all humidity i say it is you i was especially anxious to see to know if it were possible delightful as it will be also to know mr greswold it is with your name that my past associations are interwoven indeed how is that it is a long story mrs greswold to explain the association i must refer to the remote past my grandfather was in the silk trade like your grandfather mildred blushed the assertion came upon her like an unpleasant surprise it was a shock that great house of silk merchants from which her father's wealth had been derived had hardly ever been mentioned in her presence lord castle connell's daughter had never grown out of the idea that all trade is odious and her daughter had almost forgotten that her father had ever been in trade yes when the house of fawcett was in its infancy the house of felix and sons silk manufacturers and silk merchants was one of the largest on the hillside of old lyon my great-grandfather was one of the richest men in lyon and he was able to help the clever young englishman your grandfather who came into his house as corresponding clerk to perfect himself in the french language and to find out what the silk trade was like he had a small capital and when he had learned something about the trade he established himself near st paul's churchyard as a wholesale trader in a very small way he had no looms of his own in those days and it was the great house of felix and the credit given him by that house which enabled him to hold his own and to make a fortune when your father began life the house of felix was on the wane your grandfather had established a manufacture of his own at lyon felix and sons had grown old-fashioned they had forgotten to march with the times they had allowed themselves to go to sleep and they were on the verge of bankruptcy when your father came to their rescue with a loan which enabled them to tide over their difficulties they had had a lesson and they profited by it the house of felix recovered its ascendancy and the loan was repaid before your father retired from business i am not surprised to hear that my father was generous i should have been slow to believe that he could have been ungrateful said mildred softly your name is among my earliest recollections pursued castellani my mother was educated at a convent at roehampton and she was very fond of england and english people the first journey i can distinctly remember was a journey to london which occurred when i was ten years old i remember my father and mother talking about mr fawcett she had known him when she was a little girl he used to stay in her father's house when he came to lyons on business she would like to have seen him and his wife and daughter for old time's sake but she had been told that his wife was a lady of rank and that he had broken off all associations with his trading career she was too diffident to intrude herself upon her father's old ally one day our carriage passed yours in the park yes i saw you a golden-haired child yes madam saw you with these eyes and the vision has stayed with me a sunny remembrance of my own childhood i can see that fair child's face in this room to-day you should have seen my daughter faltered mildred sadly you have a daughter said the stranger eagerly i had a daughter she is gone i only put off my black gown yesterday but my heart and mind will wear mourning for her till i go to my grave ah oh, madam how deeply i sympathize with such a grief murmured castellani he had a voice of peculiar depth and beauty one of those rare voices whose every tone is music the pathos and compassion in those few commonplace words moved mildred to sudden tears she commanded herself with an effort i am very much interested in your reminiscences she said after a brief pause my father was very dear to me my mother came of an old irish family and the irish as you know are apt to be over proud of high birth i had never heard my father's commercial life spoken about until to-day 
i only knew him as an idle man without business cares of any kind able to take life pleasantly he used to spend two or three months of every year under this roof it was a terrible blow to me when we lost him six years ago and i think my husband mourned him almost as deeply as i did but tell me about your book are you really the author of nepenthe that nameless author who has been so much discussed and who has been identified with so many distinguished people mr gladstone cardinal newman mr swinburne mr browning i have heard all kinds of speculations and is it really you yes it is i to you i may plead guilty since unfortunately the authorship of nepenthe is now le secret de polichinelle it is a strange book said mildred my husband and i were both interested in it and impressed by it but your book saddened us both you seem to believe in nothing seems madam nay i know not seems but perhaps i am not so bad as you think me i am of hamlet's temper inquiring rather than disbelieving to live is to doubt and i own that i have seen enough of this life to discover that the richest gift fate can give to a man is the gift of forgetfulness i cannot think that i would not forget even if i could it would be treason to forget the beloved ones we have lost ah mrs greswold most men have worse memories than the memory of the dead the wounds we want healed are deeper than those made by death his scars we can afford to look upon there are wounds that have gone deeper and that leave an uglier mark there was a pause mr castellani made no sign of departure he evidently intended to wait for the squire's return through the open windows of a second drawing-room divided from the first by an archway they could see the servants setting out the tea-table on the lawn a turkey carpet was spread under the cedar and there were basket chairs of various shapes cushioned luxurious and two or three small wicker tables of different colours and a milking-stool or two and all the indications of outdoor life the one thing missing was that aerial figure robed in white which had been wont to flit about among the dancing shadows of branch and blossom a creature as evanescent as they it seemed to that mourning mother who remembered her to-day are you staying long at riverdale asked mildred presently by way of conversation if mrs hillersdon would be good enough to have me i would stay another fortnight the place is perfect the surrounding scenery has your true english charm and my hostess is simply delightful you like her asked mildred interested no woman can help being curious about a woman with such a history as mrs hillersdon's all the elements of romance and mystery seem from the feminine standpoint to concentre in such a career how many hearts has such a woman broken how many lives has she ruined how often has she been on the brink of madness or suicide she the placid matron with her fat carriage horses and powdered footmen and big prayer-book and demure behaviour and altogether bourgeois surroundings like her yes she is such a clever woman indeed yes she is a marvel the cleverest woman i know he laid a stress on the superlative his praise might mean anything might be a hidden sneer he might praise as the devil prays backwards mildred had an uncomfortable feeling that he was not in earnest have you known her long she asked not very long only this season i am told that she is fickle or that other people are fickle and that she seldom knows any one more than a season but i do not mean to be fickle i mean to be a house friend at riverdale all my life if she will let me she is a very clever woman and thoroughly artistic mildred had not quite grasped the modern significance of this last word does mrs hillersdon paint she asked no she does not paint she plays or sings i suppose no i am told she once sang spanish ballads with a guitar accompaniment but the people who remember her singing tell me that her arms were the chief feature in the performance her arms are lovely to this day no she neither paints nor plays nor sings but she is supremely artistic she dresses as few women of five-and-forty know how to dress dresses so as to make one think five-and-forty the most perfect age for a woman and she has a marvellous appreciation of art of painting of poetry of acting of music 
she is almost the only woman to whom i have ever played beethoven who has seemed to me thoroughly simpatica ah exclaimed mildred surprised you yourself play then it is hardly a merit in me answered castellani modestly my father was one of the finest musicians of his time in italy indeed you are naturally surprised his genius was poorly appreciated his name was hardly known out of milan and brussels strange to say those stolid flemings appreciated him his work was over the heads of the vulgar public he saw such men as verdi and gounod triumphant while he remained obscure but surely you admire verdi and gounod in their places yes both are admirable but my father's play should have been in a higher rank of composers but let me not plague you about him he is dead and forgotten he died crownless i heard you playing mozart's gloria as i came in you like mozart i adore him yes i know there are still people who like his music chopin did asked for it on his deathbed said castellani with a wry face as if he were talking of a vulgar propensity for sauerkraut or a morbid hankering for asafetida how i wish you would play something while we are waiting for my husband said mildred seeing her visitor's gaze wandering to the open piano if you will go into the garden and take your tea i will play with delight while you take it i doubt if i could play to you in cold blood i know you are critical and you think i am not simpatica retorted mildred laughing at him she was quite at her ease with him already all thought of that judas face in the church being forgotten his half deferential half caressing manner his easy confidences about himself and his own tastes had made her more familiar with his individuality in the space of an hour than she would have been with the average englishman in a month she did not know whether she liked or disliked him but he amused her and it was a new sensation for her to feel amused she sauntered softly out to the lawn and he began to play heavens what a touch was it really her piano which answered with tones so exquisite which gave forth such thrilling melody he played an improvised arrangement of schubert's ave maria and she stood entranced till the last dying arpeggio melted into silence no one could doubt that he came of a race gifted in music pray don't leave the piano she said softly from her place by the open window i will play till you call me away he answered as he began chopin's etude in c sharp minor that weird and impassioned composition reached its close just as george greswold approached from a little gate on the other side of the lawn mildred went to meet him and castellani left the piano and came out of the window to be presented to his host nothing could be more strongly marked than the contrast between the two men as they stood facing each other in the golden light of afternoon greswold tall broad-shouldered rugged-looking in his rough brown heather suit and deerstalker cap carrying a thick stick with an iron fork at the end of it for the annihilation of chance weeds in his peregrinations his fine and massive features had a worn look his cheeks were hollow his dark hair and beard were grizzled here and there his dark complexion had lost the hue of youth he looked ten years older than his actual age before him stood the italian graceful gracious in every line and every movement his features delicately chiselled his eyes dark full and bright his complexion of that milky pallor which is so often seen with hair tending towards red his brown beard of silkiest texture his hands delicately modelled and of ivory whiteness his dress imbued with all the grace which a fashionable tailor can give to the clothes of a man who cultivates the beautiful even in the barren field of nineteenth-century costume it was impossible that so marked a contrast could escape mildred's observation altogether yet she perceived it dimly the picture came back to her memory afterwards in more vivid colours she made the necessary introduction and then proceeded to pour out the tea leaving the two men to talk to each other your name has an italian sound greswold said presently it is a milanese name my father was a native of milan my mother was french but she was educated in england and all her proclivities were english it was at her desire my father sent me to rugby and afterwards to cambridge her fatal illness called me back to italy immediately after i had got my degree and it was some years before i again visited england were you in italy all that time 
asked greswold looking down absently and with an unwonted trouble in his face mildred sat at the tea-table the visitor waiting upon her insisting upon charging himself with her husband's cup as well as his own an attention and reversal of etiquette of which mr greswold seemed unconscious cassandra had returned with her master from a long walk and was lying at his feet in elderly exhaustion she saluted the stranger with a suppressed growl when he approached with the teacups cassandra adored her own people but was not remarkable for civility to strangers yes i wasted four or five years in the south in florence and venice or along the riviera wandering about like satan not having made up my mind what to do in the world greswold was silent bending down to play with cassandra who wagged her tail with a gentle largo movement in grateful contentment you must have heard my father's name when you were at milan said castellani his music was fashionable there mildred looked up with a surprised expression she had never heard her husband talk of milan and yet this stranger mentioned his residence there as if it were an established fact how did you know i was ever at milan asked greswold looking up sharply for the simplest of reasons i had the honour of meeting you on more than one occasion at large assemblies where my insignificant personality would hardly impress itself upon your memory and i met you a year later at lady lochinvar's palace at nice soon after your first marriage mildred looked up at her husband he was pale as ashes his lips whitening as she gazed at him she felt her own cheeks paling felt a sudden coldness creeping over her as if she were going to faint she watched her husband dumbly expecting him to tell this man that he was mistaken that he was confounding him george greswold with someone else but greswold sat silent and presently as if to hide his confusion bent again over the dog who got up suddenly and licked his face in a gush of affection as if she knew as if she knew he had been married before and he had told his wife not one word of that first marriage there had been no hint of the fact that he was a widower when he asked john fawcett for his daughter's hand End of chapter ten